Hello, I'm Dave Motes and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to auction to track the sale of one of the best values in farm machinery today, discs. Then we feature a unique John Deere 5020 on Aegis Iron. This tractor runs on a V8 engine. Was this original to the tractor or added later? The engine man Ray Bohax is back offering his tips on how to clean a carburetor. And after these brief messages, I tour the innovative Williams Family Farm Shop in Ohio. So please stay tuned. Don Williams needed a bigger shop for the family operation near Croton, Ohio. But wife Marcy wasn't too crazy about a shop dominating their beautiful farmstead. So the couple worked with a contractor to dress up their structure to make it blend to the farmstead. But that isn't the only innovation at this shop. Let's go talk to Don about the couple's beautiful facility. Well, originally we decided to go with a 66 wide and 80 foot long and with a lean-to on the side. Marcy wasn't real pleased with the fact that we were going to put a shop right out front here and it isn't going to look good and so on, and I really couldn't argue the point. And a friend of ours suggested that we put a porch on it and set it back a little bit and kind of make it look like it belonged here, and it's really worked out well. We used the porch and then we just came on back from there with the restroom right. and then the open area to work. I mean, we had all kind of different thoughts where we were going to have an engine room or a parts room and so on, and it really has ended up working pretty well just the way it is. So. See, you know, the other thing I noticed when we were driving up to the farm, so we got here, it looks like this is where the shop was supposed to be. Well, I mean, when you I, come on to the place, it looks like, yeah, the shop's always been there. I want to take credit for that, but I can't. That's, that was what Ronnie Goldsberry, got up the road that lined oh. things out for me on the dirt. He said, we do this and you let me move the dirt around when we're done and it'll look like it belonged there. Well, actually what you should have done is given credit to Marcy because that's well, where all the good ideas well, come, from, yeah. come from, right? Yes. <laughs> She's put up with me for this long, I guess I'd say it's mostly good ideas from that. That's so. not a bad idea no, either then. No. And talk about Marcy since you guys truly are partners in this operation. This also provides her a place to uh, to work in as well, not mechanical work, but come out to the office, right? She does some. We keep Mainly she keeps the farm books and everything in the office right. in the house, but um, she comes out and straightens me out out here. And oh, so I see how that works. This is a place for her to get rid of you then. That's probably more it than what either one of us want to admit. <laughs> and that would be in the office right next door. Right. And uh, describe how you decorated that. That is one of the nicest offices I've seen. And it's not because you spent huge amounts of money decorating. It's just the way you used wood in it so well. It's, it's just hardwood or hard cut poplar. Yeah. And it's stripped like an old barn would have been stripped. Yeah. And uh, we were fortunate enough, we found some hardwood flooring that was shorts that were different lengths. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend of, there again, a friend of the family that is good at doing those type things. And he put it all together and we said, you know, instead of some fancy ceiling or whatever, why don't we just put a white metal ceiling in here like the rest of the shop? And it really kind of made it look like it belonged that way too. Yeah, no kidding. Don was one of the first farmers I know to install a window air conditioner. Now, a window unit like this is plenty big to keep a shop this size dehumidified to keep tools from rusting and welding rods dry. And it certainly makes working in this shop a breeze in the summer. Well, the other thing that you have that I first saw in a shop now almost like first time, first time was, was 10 years ago, which was an air conditioner, when you're only air conditioner to dehumidify. But you actually had it in your old shop, what, 20 years ago, you said? Yes. Yeah, it was just hotter than heck. And a friend of ours pulled in and he said, hey, I got just what you need. I'd been griping because I needed to put an air conditioner in. He came pulling in with an old junk air conditioner that was just a 110 unit. Yeah. And we put it in and I should help quite a bit, you know. So I went to town and got a little bigger one and we used it in there and we moved it to this shop, believe it or not. I had intentions of if that wouldn't handle it, that we were going to cut a hole in the side and put an air conditioning unit in. Right. But we have almost two foot insulation in the ceiling. Wow. Uh, we've got obviously six inch walls and they're, they're full. Mm -hmm. And then in the lean-to part, since it wouldn't vent right, we put 
spray on insulation in that. I was going to ask how you insulate. Okay. So, so we didn't have to worry about getting air movement through there. All right. And uh, the only place we have a leak is around the doors. But I won't lie, it's darn nice when it's hot out to come yeah, in here. It is. Now, I know Marcy has horses along with your daughter. Right. And they're quite well known in the quarter horse circles. But you're quite known in another horsepower circle, which is pulling trucks? Yes. Uh, we pulled quite a little bit of NTPA for quite a while, but last year or two, we've just gone back to the Ohio State circuit and so on. Yeah. And uh, fortunate enough, last year, we ended up first and second wow. with the two-wheel drive class. Probably will never manage anything close to that again, but it's uh, kind of good for the ego for a while. Yeah, it is. Don invested in extruded aluminum piping, which he feels is one of the better investments that he made in the shop. I'm noticing the air system, the blue pipe, that extruded aluminum, and that was how you plumbed it in, right? That right. works pretty slick, doesn't it? Oh, we real love it. Uh, you know, you just slide it in, hand tighten it, and that's it. Um, wow. You don't have to, no tools other than just when you cut it, go ahead and deburr the end and so on. Right. And, uh, you know, it's good, I think, 180 pounds right. of pressure. And, uh, that flows a lot more air than what steel pipe would. Yeah, because you don't have the resistance right, right. on there. But also, it doesn't corrode. No, there's no corrosion to it. And if you ever need to add something to it? Matter of fact, we already have. We didn't have one on this side of the shop and decided, well, this is kind of stupid running air hose over here all the time. We thought we could reach from the door over here and so on. Yeah. And it just didn't suit us. So we just took the elbow apart and put a T in. and Well, you went. Yeah. You know, I love this idea that Don and Marcy came up with. They had the joists, of course, extended from their office ceiling to create this eyebrow to form additional storage in the lighting. Well, I'll see you again on another Top Shop tour. Hello, I'm Ray Bohax, and welcome to the Engine Man segment of the Successful Farming TV show. I'm on location in Columbia, Ohio at the Firestone Ag Test Farm. It's a real neat place, and that's where they do all the development testing for their farm tires. What we're gonna talk about today is carburetors, and specifically about cleaning a carburetor. Now you may be saying to yourself, I haven't bought a new vehicle or a new engine with a carburetor for many years. And as far as a road vehicle is concerned, you would be correct. The last production engine with a carburetor was in 19, 1986. But you'll have, I've never been to a farm that does not have older carburetor vehicles or a new vehicle or a new engine, for instance, like on a C10 or a UTV that has a carburetor. So people may think that it's really simple to clean a carburetor, all you do is spray it. Well, that's like saying it's real simple to put seed in the ground and you have a crop. So what I'm gonna talk about is the finesse, the engine man points of how to clean a carburetor. So the first thing we need to do is I want to have full disclosure, this is not my carburetor. I would never have a carburetor this dirty, but this is probably representative of what you will find out in the field. So the thing is that what we need to be concerned with is first going around the carburetor and snugging all the screws and tightening it. Now we're going to clean it. The proper way to clean a carburetor is to first identify all the parts. What I need you to do is you need to take the mixture screws out and clean those passages. What you would do first is, is you would gently seat the mixture screw and count how many turns it is to gently seat it so you know where to put it back in. Take out the mixture screw and then you will inspect it. It's imperative that you inspect the needle for any dirt, debris, or sometimes it'll have burrs on it. What I like to do is keep an old piece of scotch right around very mild scotch bright. The scotch bright has seen its better day, but it's perfect to polish a mixture screw so you do not burr the surface. You would want to polish the mixture screw, clean it up, inspect it, spray it with some carburetor cleaner, and then what you would do is you would take the carburetor cleaner and spray it through the mixture screw hole because you want to make sure that that passage is clean. If you have a carburetor that does not want to seem to adjust, you're turning the mixture screws in and out. In the industry, we call that unresponsive. Historically, it has dirt in that passage. The other thing you need to be mindful of is that every carburetor has an air bleed, has multiple air bleeds. This particular carburetor has the air bleed on the top. The jets and the mixture screw in the carburetor provide the fuel. The air bleed shapes the fuel curve. 
If there is dirt or by the air bleed hole, that carburetor will not run properly and you will actually think that the carburetor is defective and needs to be rebuilt, but it is just the air bleed is dirty. So you would identify it and spray your carburetor cleaner into the air bleed hole. That is it. Clean your carburetors, you have a great running engine. See you next time in the farm shop. What's one of the best values and used farm machinery today? Discs. After these brief messages, I return to track the values on late model John Deere 2623 discs. So please stay tuned. I'm at a consignment sale and I spied in the rows of all the machinery this 2623 disc. What we have here is a 2012 implement that's 30 and a half feet wide featuring walk and tandem axles and rolling baskets. But what really attracted my attention to this six year old deer disc is its great shape and that it would make a welcome addition to any farm. Deer designed this disc for tackling medium to heavy soils and the 30 and a half foot version of this 2623 is the most popular of the deer discs. What would be crucial to know prior to bidding on a disc like this is what to look for when inspecting it for wear and tear. To get some inspection pointers, I'm going to go talk to Tim Meyer of Steffes Auction, the firm holding today's sale. Tim, we were looking at that John Deere 2623. It really is in great shape. It's a 2012. That makes somebody a great tillage disc. Boy, Dave, you know, you picked an interesting piece there. First of all, you're right. It's a beautiful disc. It's 2012. It's got low acres on it. It's definitely a fall tillage tool. We're coming right into season here. Uh, but that is something that a farmer has learned they can live without. And so that is an area that's softened up a little bit ahead of everything else with the commodity prices and where we're at. So, Tim, you're telling me right now is a great time to buy used tillage equipment. It's a great way to look at it, Dave. You know, that disc new was in the 60,000 range, and that wouldn't have been retail. That probably what where you would have settled out, sitting in front of the desk next to the dealer. But uh, that disc, you know, and, and I know you're going to cringe a little bit, but I'm hoping that disc brings at least in the low 20s tomorrow. Yeah. Um, 2025 will probably catch that disc. The downside of that disc is it's not a vertical tillage tool. Yeah. It's basically a fall only tool, which is very useful, but you know, people are tending to move a little bit more towards a vertical tillage tool because they can use it in the fall in the spring. Bang. Now, the question I have about that is when you're looking at implements, and that's a 2012, and it looked to be in great shape, what should you look for on wear and tear? I know there's a difference between a 12, 2012, and say a 2002 and a 2000, or maybe even a 1998 on wear and tear. Well, on the older models, you always want to expect the, the disc blades. Um, you know what, call the dealer and find out what was the standard disc blade width of that when it came out new. Just run a simple tape across it and because a disc you really don't know what's not there. Right. So that's a good way and of course we're all looking for high residues so the bigger the disc the better advantages that you have. Next would be inspect it generally just for welds maybe that were put on it. Maybe there's cracks that need welded on it. Right. Those are all things and then you know bearings although they're really cheap they're a son of a gun to put in yes. and so inspect the bearings and make sure sure that uh, there isn't any play in them and there, there's not a lot of looseness there. Tires of course and, and things like that. The other thing that I really like to look at is the hitch. The hitch tells the story on an implement. It, you can tell by the hitch how many acres it's been over. So if it's got a lot of egging really? in it, make sure you take a look at some oh. other things. That's a good place to start and then venture out through the rest of it and, and, and it'll tell the, its own story. Well thanks for that information Tim. Let's watch that Deer 2623 sell. Now, 
The final bid is in on our 30 and a half foot wide John Deere 2623. It brought 24,500. That makes it a great deal when I compared it to dealer asking prices I discovered online at Deere's equipment sales site, machinefinder.com. Similar age and with similar width, 2623s with rolling baskets were being listed for between $49,000 up to $66,000. Now, knowing such pricing information certainly gives you peace of mind when bidding at auction or negotiating on a dealer's lots. And you can get some free access to data pricing information. We now offer two free appraisals a month from the Authority on Equipment Values, Iron Solutions. Used by banks, manufacturers, and dealers from across North America, Iron Solutions gathers actual dealer sales, auction prices, and wholesale transactions on farm equipment built in the last 20 years. Iron Solutions is the place that dealers go to to set trade-in offers and sale prices. Get your two free appraisals each month by going to agriculture.com slash what's it worth. I'll see you again next week on another Steel Deals Report. After these brief messages, we feature a unique tractor from the Prizel Collection of Wisconsin, a John Deere 5020 with a V8 diesel. So please stay tuned. Our Aegis Iron Feature Tractor this week is a rare John Deere 5020. Now, being a 5020 doesn't make it rare. What does is the fact that this tractor is an engine conversion. And this is owned by Gary, Chad, and Dan Prizel of Mondovi, Wisconsin. I've been out to your place before, and I'm used to seeing minis and Olivers and cockshuts and whites. This is the only green tractor you have in your collection. You gotta explain to me, first of all, how did a deer get into an other colors collection? And what's with this engine sitting in this tractor? Yep, this is definitely the only other green that we have in the collection. <laughs> um, we've had uh, for sale over the years a few 5020s with the Detroit conversions that Kinsey had done. Right, um, and, and, and we're talking about John Kinsey, Bob Kinsey Manufacturing in, correct. in Iowa. Yep, um, and then this one happened to pop up with a 903 Cummins in it never heard or seen one before so we just thought it was something different so we bought it and went through it and restored it just to have something different in the collection. Dan you've got to explain first of all where did you find this tractor? Uh, this one actually came from uh, a jockey that we know down in Tennessee um, and he had bought it actually it came out of Arkansas State. Uh, okay. When we bought it it had a solid steel push bar on the front uh, they were using it for pushing rail cars. Now the engine in this, this is an eight cylinder Cummings with two turbos on the side. Yep. And how much horsepower would this thing generate? We've been told anywhere from 450 to 600 horse it should be. Good God. And the, the 5020s were actually rated for what? Originally out of the factory, 130? Uh, I believe in they were like in the 150 range. You found this tractor down there. Was it in this condition when you got it though? Um, no, definitely not. It was pretty run down when we got it. Um, when we bought it, the clutch was stuck. Mm. Um, they had tried to get it running. They were trying to pull start it. They about ran themselves over. So that guy said, nope, we're done with it. If you guys want to tackle it, go ahead. But the engine was running or you didn't know for sure? We had never heard it run. Um, we bought it non-running, non-driving because they had never got it running with the clutch issue. Um, and it sat around here for about 10 years before we even started working on it. Drained the fuel system all out, put all new fuel hoses on it, uh, turned her over a few times, wow. fired right up on all eight. And the, it, and the clutch didn't prove to be that big a problem then? It was kind of hard to split it and put a clutch in it, but 
they did use a John Deere uh, 6030 clutch, so that's what kind of oh, okay. leads us to think too of that it's possibly had to, a, had to be one of John Kinzebaugh's uh, conversions. Um, and since we've gotten this one done, we've heard of one other one in Michigan with a 903. Oh, yeah. Might. Not sure if that one's got twin turbos like this one does, but we do know of one other one out there. You also run a business then restoring tractors. Here at the Tractor Doctor, um, yeah, we do, we do st still do some repair work for farmers. Now we've getting more into the restoration side. Mm -hmm. After we've done so many of our own, we decided that we can do some for customers now. So that's the growing part of the business. And then you trade, and buy and sell tractors as well. Correct, yep, we still buy and sell and uh, repair tractors for farmers. So if somebody's really desperate to get this tractor, they can get a hold of you at the tractor doctor and try to talk you out of it. Correct, yep, and this one we actually did just put up for sale last week. Oh, so you did? It's in the collection, but if somebody wants it, it would be one that we'd be willing to part with. So tell me, if somebody's trying to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the easiest way, uh, can find all our information at tractor-dr.com. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. That episode features our team of farmer evaluators and their observations on selected UTVs. Have you ever heard Jolene Brown speak? If not, then you're in for a treat. Jolene joins us next week and talks about family relationships and a farm operation. And then I head to auction to watch the sale of a late model John Deere 8530 four-wheel drive tractor sale. And on All Around the Farm, we showcase a shop heater built from a modified cabin stove. See you next week, right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.